Stanford University. We are back, lecture four, Stanford CS193P, spring of 2020. Today, I'm going to start off with a big demo, and it's going to be to make our card game be rows and columns instead of all across in one row, which is gonna make our game a lot better, no doubt, but it's also gonna be a super good example of doing generics with protocols and also functions as types. And we're gonna learn more about being a container view because we're gonna build our own rows and columns container view for our cards. After that demo, we're gonna hop back into the slides here. We're gonna talk more about the Swift type system, specifically the type enum. And then after that, we're gonna continue in the slides and talk about the one of the most important types in all of Swift, optional, which happens to be an enum. An optional is so important that I'm gonna go right back into a demo after that and show you two really important examples of using an optional to design your code in Swift. So let's get started with that demo. All right, well, it's time to fix this major deficiency in our game, which is that all of the cards are in one row. And we know that we could much more efficiently use this space if we had rows and columns. We're gonna do that by replacing our H stack here with a grid. Now, as of the taping of this class, there was no such thing as a grid in Swift UI. So we're gonna to have to write that. And it actually provides us with a great opportunity to learn a lot about how things like Z stack work. So Z stack we know takes this argument right here, which is a function. This curly brace means it's a function. It's a function that takes no arguments, unlike, for example, for each, its function to create a view takes an argument. But Z stack, the view that gets built here is quite powerful. It could be a list of other views. It could be an if then, a combination thereof. So this particular function that can build these complicated view is called a view builder. And we're not going to use view builder quite yet. We'll eventually learn about view builder. So our grid is just going to have a simple view that it's going to replicate using a for each, exactly the same way as a for each, to put a certain view at every spot in the row and column. So our grid is really going to combine H stack like grid, except for 2D H stack if you want to think of it, with for each like this. We're going to take an array of identifiable things like these cards, and then we're going to pass a function that takes one of the identifiable things as its argument and returns the view to use to draw at that location in the grid. Very simple here. So let's go create that view. I'm gonna go over here to new file. I'm gonna put it in its own file because this is really a very powerful reusable object. We could use it in all our apps that needed a grid. So it is a Swift UI view. So I'm gonna click there. I'm gonna call it grid. I'm gonna double check that it's in one of these yellow folders here and that this content kind of matches that and it does. So we're good. And here's our grid, and of course we get hello world. This code down here, you'll remember at the bottom, is to hook us up to our canvas over here. But this grid is completely generic, and so if we are going to make this preview work, we would need to come up with some test data for it. And we're not going to do that in this demo, but someday in the future, maybe you could do it as an exercise. But if you ever delete this and need it back, it'll say create preview here in your canvas. All right, so we gotta get started on grid. First thing we're gonna do is it's two arguments. The first argument is this array of identifiable. And the second argument is this function that takes one of the identifiables and provides a view. So let's get those two arguments there as vars. So the first var is, I'll call it items, an array of item. And this item for us in grid is a don't care. We really don't care what that thing is. It could be anything. It's going to be a card over here, but it, there's no reason for it to be any particular thing. So it's a don't care for us. And similarly, that second argument, view for item, I'll call it, that's a function. It's a function that takes an item as the argument and it returns 
some item view, which is another don't care for us. We really don't care what kind of view you provide for each item. So that's who don't care, item view. Good start. And we could actually get this going over here. Unfortunately, we have to name this items right there. This one is really view for item. And get that right there. But this is the last argument to this function. So we know that when you have the last argument to a function is another function, then we can just get rid of that label, close it off, and have our function trying to float on the outside. So this is the last argument to our grid. And that is both of its vars, this one and the view for item. Just like when we called card view here, we had to initialize its vars you know, as this one card var. Same thing here with grid, we're initializing its two vars. This might be a good time to talk about how is it that for each doesn't have to have this label items. When we had for each, it just had the iteratable thing that had identifiables in it. How come it didn't have an argument? Well, it's using technology that you know well to do that. So let's do it in grid as well, which is it's just an init. So normally you might have your init say items is an array of item, view for item is a function that takes an item and returns some item view. That would be a normal kind of init. And in here, you just want to initialize your bars like items. Well, oh, that's equal to the items that are passed in. And then view for item, that's equal to the view for item that's passed in. By the way, Swift is going to be very confused here because it doesn't know which items this is and which item this is. We've got a local argument to this function called items, and then we have a property called items. So you can easily fix Swift's confusion here by just saying self.items and self.view for item. This is a different reason to have to put self here than we saw with the explicit self, blah, 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 hit fix. But it makes sense here, right? By doing self.items, now Swift knows that we're talking about the green one and that this one must be the black one. Now, <clears throat> this allows us to put this underbar as the external name. Remember, underbar is external name, means do not provide an external name. And that's, in fact, exactly what's going on here. And if I rebuild, you're going to see that this code over here, perfectly fine. However, we still have a problem back here in our grid. This error right here. It says assigning non-escaping parameter view for item to an escaping closure. So I'm going to try and explain this escaping closure in just a few minutes. Normally, I would actually probably have slides on it. I'm going to skip that this quarter because in Swift UI, since we're doing functional programming, almost everything is a value type. And the problem that this escaping closure thing is trying to address here really really rare in Swift UI. Happened a lot more when we had object-oriented programming in UI Kit. So here's what's going on. This function that's passed in here that creates a view for a given item is not actually used in this initializer. We salt it away into a var and call it later. We're going to call it down here in our body when we need to actually create the views for all of our items. So we have to mark this kind of function, at sign escaping. You can think of it as this function is going to escape from this initializer without getting called. Now, Swift has to be careful, and it's actually very powerful, and knows how to deal with these functions that might get called later. Why can that be an issue? Well, let's look back here where we actually pass this function in. Whatever code is in here, has to be able to be called later. So if we use any variables, especially if we use a local variable or something from this function, that has to be around in the future when this function gets executed. Now, how does Swift accomplish this wonderful feat of keeping everything in here around until the future? Well, it does this by making function types be reference types, just like classes our view model, our reference types, they live in the heap, right? They're stored in memory, people have pointers to them. 
Same thing with these functions that can be called later. They live in the heap and they have pointers to them. Now, the things inside of here might also live in the heap. If any of the things in here are classes, for example, then the self in here is going to be a pointer to something in the heap. And the problem we're trying to avoid here in Swift is having self have some var in it that actually points to this function, because we know this function points to self inside here. They're both going to be in the heap. The function's kept in the heap because it's going to be executed later. All the things inside the function have to be kept in the heap so that it will properly execute later. And so if anything in here points back, we've got a situation where two things in the heap are pointing to each other. And the way that Swift cleans up memory is when nobody points to something anymore, it cleans up the memory and frees it up for someone else to use. Well, if two things are pointing to each other and they're both in the heap, they're never going to be able to go away because they're always going to have a pointer to each other. That's called a memory cycle. So this whole thing is to try to make it so that we can detect memory cycles by seeing these escaping functions. Amazingly, this is also why you get this warning about self. You know, when we don't put a self dot in here in our on tap gesture function, we're going to get this error that says, this requires explicit self to make the capture semantics explicit. Capture semantics means the fact that it's going to capture everything in here and inside this on tap gestures function and keep it in the heap so that when on tap gesture executes it in the future, when someone taps on this card, that this stuff is still around. Well, if you look at this code, you're thinking, oh, well, I guess it captures view model, but it actually oh, would have to capture self. So it makes you type the self so that you realize, oh, yes, this function is going to make self be in memory. And then you can verify that self doesn't actually somehow directly or indirectly come back around and point to this function, which it doesn't do in this case, because in here, our view model never points to our views. Views point to the view model, but not backwards direction. So it's no problem. But even more, it's no problem because this self dot does not live in the heap anyway. This self dot is this struct. Self is this struct. Structs are value types. They don't live in the heap. So this is not necessary anyway. And that is the fix that has been publicly approved that you're probably going to see a couple of months after this video is made. So this is going to be out of date quickly, this video. But the fix is basically if self, in this case, inside of one of these escaping functions that's going to be held around in the heap, if self doesn't live in the heap, in other words, it's a value type, a struct or an enum, then you don't need to have this error come up and warn you, hey, you put self dot there so you make sure you don't have a memory cycle where self points to this function, this function points to self. That can't happen because there aren't two things in the heap that could point to each other because self is a struct. It's a value type, does not live in the heap. Okay, so there you got just a little quick explanation of all this escaping and that you even understand now what this self dot is. If you don't understand all the things I just said about these escaping functions and this self dot, really, I don't think you have to worry about it that much for a couple of reasons. One, this week's reading, you're going to read about these closures, these functions that are in line that capture the stuff they need to be able to execute later. So when you read that, maybe you'll understand it. Of course, you always have the option, go on the class forums, ask more about it to clarify. And finally, with Swift UI, it's just not that important because so many of the self dots are just value types. Everything in the view, for example, is all value types. Our view model, it's a class. It has possibilities, okay? But since the view model never points to anything in the view, we never really have to worry about anything in the view creating these memory cycles. It'd be very rare. It's possible to do, but very, very rare. So the bottom line is I don't think you have to worry about it that much. The only thing that's going to bother you is that you're always going to have to put self dot in front of these things, or you're going to have to deal with this error and do this click on it and fix all the time. Again, that's something you're only going to have to do till the beta of this public thing comes out, hopefully in a couple of months. But 
at worst a few months and after that then you won't have to worry about this at all because not putting self here when self is a value type will not generate this warning that is the proposed fix all right that's enough of that aside with this all started because we had this warning that told us we had to put escaping here because indeed this function does escape from this init by because we put it in this bar let's do our body okay, our body is not hello world obviously our body is actually quite simple it's just a for each of all of our items and for each of our items we are going to return our view for item of that item we're going to call our function view for item this is a bar that's a function we're going to call it and of course we're in a for each it also has an escaping function there for the view so we have to say self dot this creates some errors for us so let's look at these the first one says cannot convert value of type array of item to expected argument type a uh, range of int oh no we saw this exact argument problem when we were over here doing for each the first time Right, we were passing this array of cards and we we're like, oh, I thought I could do that. We used to pass zero dot dot less than four and we went to array and I had told you that this for each takes an array, but we learned that it was an array only of identifiable things. So we have the same exact problem here. This for each, this items has to be an array of identifiable things. Well, that's a problem for us because item is a don't care. We have no idea what this thing is. But here is where we get constraints and gains into the act. We're going to say where item is identifiable. So now we've created a grid that only works with this don't care when that don't care is identifiable. So this can still be anything, but it has to be identifiable. This is what I was talking about in the slides, a care a little bit kind of things. We care a little bit about item. We care that it's identifiable. So now we have a different error here. This for each error is saying return type of property body, this is our body, requires that item view conform to view. So what is item view? That's the return type of this function. And of course that makes sense, right? Because for each can only use views to have views for these items. This has to be a view. So this view for item return type here of item view, it has to be a view. And what type is it? It's a don't care as well. We'll do the same thing here. Item view has to be a view. You all seeing how we're connecting generics, this is a very generic struct right here, with protocols. These are protocols, and we're using them to constrain these don't cares to work. The next thing we have to do here is we're a container. Grid contains all these views. It puts them in rows and columns. It contains them. And we know the container's job is to take the space that's offered to them and divide it up amongst the things inside. That means we need to figure out how much space has been allocated to us. And we know how to do that. That's geometry reader. Okay, geometry reader, geometry in is going to allow us to find out how much space was given to the grid, which we're then going to hand off to these guys. So I'll put this in here. Now, as soon as we put it, as soon as we put it in here, of course, we're going to get the self dot problem with items. I'm going to use the same solution I used last time, which is I'm going to create a func here called body for size, CG size. It's going to return some view, of course. And I'm going to put my code for my body inside here. And here I'm just going to say self.body or geometry dot size. Again, this is just purely to make it so I don't have to do self dot inside this body. Just like geometry reader is escaping, and so we did this self dot body. For each is also escaping, and so I'm going to do the same thing here. Self dot body for item in size. I'm going to move this to another little func body for item in size turn some view and now i don't need the self dot here just return that so we've arranged our code nicely here all we have left to do believe it or not is to actually offer these views some of our space and then to position them that's what containers do offer space and they position 
To do this, we need to do some math because we've been offered the space and now we need to divide it up by however many items we have here. And to do that math, I actually wrote some code that I gave you and we're gonna use here, let's drag it in. By the way, when you drag code in, be sure to do this copy items if needed. That's almost always what you want. You want a copy of that code to be put in your project. Otherwise, it's going to be referring to your desktop or wherever you dragged it from. All right, so we'll finish that. So here, let's take a look at this little, this is the math, this grid layout, the math that does this calculation. So let's take a look. Now I've collapsed the init and this two bar and funk here, because we're not gonna look at the implementation of these. I do encourage you after this lecture to go and take a look at the implementation of this and see if you can figure it out. Okay, you'll need the rest of this lecture to have the knowledge to be able to really understand what this do, this is doing, but it's a good exercise to try and understand this thing. It's only about 10 lines of code, so you shouldn't have too much trouble with it. But here's what a grid layout does. Its initializer takes a number of items and a size, and it divides that size up by those items. It does exactly what grid wants. Now, it also even lets you specify kind of a desired aspect ratio. It can't guarantee that, but it can try and get close to it. And that's it. We just create a grid layout that does that. Then we have a bar here that'll tell us the size of the items. They're all the same size, so this will be the size. And then also the location of each item as a point. This is the center of each item, which again, exactly what grid wants. So grid layout was definitely made with grid in mind, but it's pretty much a generic divider up of CG size by a certain number of items. So let's create this grid layout by calling this initializer right here. I'm going to do it up in my geometry reader. In fact, I'm going to change this passing of the size to instead pass a grid layout. And the item count is just the number of items that we have. This is our items array right here, its count. And I'm going to skip the desired aspect ratio thing. We'll just use whatever the default is. Hopefully in your reading, you saw that you can have default arguments for functions and grid layout uses that. But you do have to have the size. And this is of course going to be in geometry.size. And we're still inside a geometry reader here. So this items is gonna to have to be self.items. It's an instance variable there. So I've changed this body for, instead of body for size, it's now a body for a layout, grid layout here. And same thing, I'm gonna to have to pass this on through. So this is now body for item in layout. So that makes this a layout as well, passing it on down the line. And now we're in here, we've got this layout. We've laid it out with the number of items in our size. So we can easily do things like offer space to these views, which we do with frame. So we're going to see frames width is the layout's item size dot width, and the frames height is the layout's item size dot height. All the, we're going to offer the same little subspace of our space to each of the items. That's what item size in grid layout does. Again, grid layout was created with this many items in the size that was offered to us. That's how we divided it up. And then we have to position the view. So we do that with position. That's the function we do it with. And we're gonna position it to, at the layout's location of item at index. So this is indexed, just like we had with our cards, in fact. So we have to find the index of this item in our item array. No problem, we kind of know how to do that. We'll say let index equal, mm, I know how to do this. I'm gonna create a function on myself, index of this item. And I'm gonna go down here and say func index of item. And that's gonna return an int, an index into the array. We'll return zero first here and then we'll fill it out in a second. Now, this is going to confuse Swift again a little bit because you've got index, this local variable, and then index, this function. So we can fix that again, same way, self dot. Now it knows this index is the function, and this index is a local variable we're creating. So we do actually use self dot, even once they make that change with the value type self dots not being flagged like that, we still sometimes want to use self dot to 
define the difference or between something that's a property or a function versus a local variable or a parameter to the function. All right, in index here, how are we gonna find this item in the array? Well, guess what? These items are identifiable. And probably some of you are like, hmm, this seems awfully familiar. But yeah, we're gonna do for index in zero dot dot less than the items count that we have. And if the items at that index dot ID equals this items ID, then we're going to return that index. And otherwise, otherwise we're gonna return zero, which is just as bogus as it was the last time we did this. Okay, now this function is kind of double bogus. It's bogus in that we're still doing this return zero. In other words, if we can't find the item in our items, well, we'll just return the first item, index zero right there. That's bogus. But what's also bogus is that this code is exactly the same, yes, as this code over here in our model. So, man, you never want to write the exact same code like this twice. That is just terrible programming. Well, we're going to fix that in a minute. But first, let's just see if our grid works. Believe it or not, this is all we need for our grid. There's nothing else. We get the space that's offered to us. We use this grid layout to divide it up. And then we offer it to our little sub views in there. And then we position them at those locations in the grid layout. That's all that's required. So let's take a run here, see if it worked. Ah, and it did. Look at that. There's our six cards, not in a row anymore. Let's go landscape. And look, it resized the cards to fit the space better. Now, I would like a little bit of padding between the cards, but that's a matter back here of when we create our card views, we can just put a little padding on there. Right? If we put some padding around these card views inside of our grid, eh, we get the padding. Oh, works great. Maybe we don't want quite so much padding. Maybe we just want padding of five. Run that. Yeah, that looks pretty darn good. Okay, well, now that our grid is working, let's go and fix the bogus code that we have right here, which is this index of item. And it's bogus because it totally replicates this other thing. Let's think a little bit about what's going on here. What are we actually asking in both cases to happen? We have an array of things that are identifiable. And we have one of those things, hopefully. Right? We know it's identifiable as well. And we want to look and see if we can find it. So that sounds to me more like an array thing. Let's add a function to array that does this. Extension array. But only to arrays where the elements in the array are identifiable. So there it is again, constraints and gains. We are all, this extension only is going to add this function that we want to add to those kind of arrays. And so it's the same function. In fact, I'm just going to copy and paste and we'll modify this or even cut and paste, cut that out of there, paste this in here. It's not quite the same in here because here we were looking at items. Obviously this is an array function. So now items is self and same thing here. It's not the items count, it's self's count, right? And the type of this item, the index of item, it's not item, it's element. Because that's what we're looking at in an array. We have an array whose elements are all identifiable. And what we're saying here is get the index of one of the elements of this array that's identifiable by looking it up. Now, this is correct, and this does the right thing, but I actually don't like the naming that I've chosen here. One thing about this is it doesn't actually return the index of this item. It returns the first one it finds. It's going through the array from zero on up, and when it finds one, it returns it. So this is really the first index of this item. I also don't like the word item. Item makes sense up here in grid because we have item. The word item is all over the place. But really in array, there's no, item is not a thing. There's element, but there's no item. And really what this is, is the first index matching that element. So I'm gonna use first index matching as my name. This feels more like an array function, first index matching this element. So how do we use that up here? 
instead of self index of, we're just going to say items, the array, dot first index matching the item. So we're asking the array to do this now, to go find the first index matching this item. And we can do exactly the same thing over here. We no longer even need this function. We get it out of here because we know that our cards array right here can do first index matching the card. So we are reusing this code. And look how small our model has become. It's tiny. There's hardly any code in here. And some of that is because we've just made array more powerful to look this thing up. Same thing with grid. Grid, very small amount of code because we're leveraging this array. Now, this array thing has nothing to do with grid, so it does not belong here in grid.swift. So I'm going to cut it out of grid.swift and I'm going to put it in its own file. It's not a Swift UI view, it's just regular Swift file. Now, when we do extensions uh, like this, we usually call the file array, the thing we're extending, plus some sort of descriptor of what kind of thing this is. And so this is kind of identifiable, array plus identifiable. So let's go in here. There it is. Paste it in. Notice that this is imports foundation, which is perfectly fine. This is not a UI thing. This is purely arrays and identifiables. None of those are UI things. So we go back to grid. Do build here so that it notices all this stuff and make sure that our model also is working and it is no errors in fact no errors in our whole program let's run make sure that our array is doing it and it is all right so once again we are using this whole concept of constraints and gains here we are constraining the don't care type of the array so that they're identifiable, and that allows us to gain this function for all arrays where elements are identified, they get this. No arrays that don't have identifiable elements, they don't even see this function. It's not even, wouldn't even escape complete in Xcode. It's not even there. And we're doing the same thing with constraints and gains here to make it so that our grid is always a grid of identifiable things matching to things that are views. That is it for this demo. So I'm going to go back to the slides and we're going to fix this. And we need the type in Swift called optional to do this, a very, very important type, which is an enum. So let's do a quick review of what enums are, and then we'll talk about this very important type, optional. Enums are just another type like struct or class. But in the case of an enum, the value is discrete. Good example here, fast food menu item is either a hamburger or it's fries or it's drink or it's cookie it can't be anything else it's gotta be one of those four things that's the only things on the menu and it has to be one and only one of those things enum like a struct is a value type it gets copied as you pass it around it does not live in the heap there's no pointers to it it's a value type now what's cool about enums in swift unlike most other languages, is that each of the discrete values can have some associated data with it that's very specific to that particular discrete value. For example, we have a hamburger here, and if the fast food menu item is a hamburger, we're gonna say, how many patties? Is this a double or a triple or single? If it's fries, is this a large fry, a small fries? If it's a drink, you'll see there we have a string which is Coke or Dr. Pepper or whatever. Notice that that string is unnamed right there, so these things don't have to have names. This yellow syntax that you're seeing here probably, hopefully, looks familiar from your reading. This is just a tuple, right? So all the rules of tuples, which allow you to have labels or not labels and have as many items as you want here, all perfectly valid as the associated data values right here. So how do you set the value of an enum? It's very simple. You just say the name of the enum, like fast food menu item, dot the discrete value, hamburger or cookie right here. Now, of course, in the case where there's associated data, you have to provide that associated data, hamburger patties too, in this case. There's no way for it to create 
a hamburger if it doesn't know how many patties there are. Now, Swift can do type inference here so that you don't have to type fast food menu item on both sides of this equals. But you have to be a little bit careful. You have to put it on one side of the equals because in the case, if you just say var yet another item equals cookie, Swift does not have an information to infer that we're talking about fast food menu items here. Okay, it could be anything that has a cookie. So you have to somewhere fast food menu item has to appear so that Swift can infer. How do we check the value? You might think it would be like an if, you know, if this menu item equals a hamburger, then do something. But we don't use if with enum. We use this expression switch. Now, switch exists in other languages, very powerful in Swift, not only for checking enums, as you're going to see, but it has regular expression matching and all kinds of stuff. Again, you read about that, hopefully, in your reading assignment. So if I want to check what value menu item has, I'm going to switch on menu item and then have a case statement for every single possible menu item. And it has to be every single one. Now, I'm not paying any attention here to the associated data, and I'm allowed to ignore that here. I can still have case fast food menu item dot hamburger print the word burger. I can't say how many patties it is because I haven't looked at the associated data. I'm going to show you that in a second, but I can still print burger if I want here. Swift can infer, of course, that these are all fast food menu items, so you don't have to say case fast food menu item dot hamburger every time. You can just switch on the menu item and use dot hamburger dot fries dot drink. It knows menu item is a fast food menu item in this case. By the way, switch requires you to cover every single possible case. So you might have a case like hamburger that you don't care about. You don't want to print out hamburger. In that case, you can just say break. So break breaks out of the switch. And saying case hamburger break means it will do nothing if the menu item is a hamburger. Similarly, if you really only care about a couple of cases and all the rest, you can just do some default behavior. You can use this special keyword default. So default will happen if you didn't list a specific case for something. But you have to do one or the other. You either have to have all the cases and the ones you don't care about you break out of, or you can only have some of the cases, but then you have to provide this default case as required in Switch in general, not just for enums, but always in Swift. Switches require complete and utter coverage of all possibilities. What about that associated data? Well, we can do that in Switch as well. We just add this stuff you're seeing in yellow here, where when we say case hamburger, we say parentheses, let patty count. And that is going to grab the associated data with hamburger and assign it to this little very local variable patty count that's only going to be valid for this print statement or whatever that's happening after this hamburger. Same thing with the fries. And for example, the drink is interesting. So the drink is going to grab the brand and the ounces. Notice that ounces used to have a label when I declared it, but I didn't do that here. And that's okay because this is tuples. Tuples, you can use the labels if you want on both sides, declaring and using it. And so this is the exact same thing that's going on here where the associated value, you can grab it however you want to grab it. All right, let's see, methods. Yes, you can have methods on enums, it's pretty much unlimited, whatever you want to do. And properties, uh, you can have computed properties, but you can't have any stored properties. All the storage that goes with an enum is only in these associated values, which kind of makes sense because an enum is a discrete thing. It really wouldn't make sense to have other data that applies to all of them, that wouldn't be discrete. All right, so uh, this is why you have to do this. Switching on self. All right, so if you have a function in your enum and it's supposed to essentially tell you something about the enum, which is really common to have these kind of functions. Here I have this function is included in special order number, which is going to say whether this fast food menu item is included in a certain special order. And to do that, I'm going to have to switch on myself and see what I am to see if I'm included in that special order. So you can see I have a bunch of examples here. One of these examples I want to look at a little bit closer, which is this drink example. Notice that it's getting the associated value in the switch, 
for but for the ounces, but it's ignoring whether to Coke or Dr. Pepper. We don't care. It doesn't matter in terms of whether it's included in a special order. So this underbar is the don't pay any attention to this. I'm not interested, essentially. Just like when we have a function, it has parameters that have external names and internal names. We use that underbar to say, uh, we're not interested in the external name, don't use it. That's what this means here as well. So this is how, if you had some associated value that had, as a tuple that had multiple things, you can just ignore some of them when you're getting the values. Uh, enums can do constraints and gains with protocols, just like structs and classes can. There's a very interesting protocol called case iterable. Okay, case iterable, you gain a var called all cases. It's a static var, so you send it to the type, like your Tesla model dot all cases you see there. And it's just going to return to you a, an iterable thing, something you can do for in over of all the cases. And that can be super valuable in your assignment three. It's likely that you're going to need to use this. Now that we know what an enum is, we can talk about probably the most important enum in all of Swift, which is called optional. So an optional looks essentially like this. It's got two discrete values. One is the case none, and one is the case sum. And in the sum case, it has associated value, which is a don't care to optional. Optional does, works with any type. It doesn't care what type it is. So essentially, optional is either is in the is set case, that's sum, or the not set case, that's the none. And that's what an optional is. Essentially a type. You're going to have variables of type optional. They're either going to be set or not set. And if they're set, they're going to have associated value of some type, which they don't, optional doesn't care what type that is. So where do we use optional? Well, uh, you can imagine we use it any time we have a variable whose value could either be not set or unspecified or undetermined, anything like that. So what are some examples? Well, the return, that bogus return type of first index matching, if the matching thing is not in the array, we're currently returning zero. And that's the first element in the array. That's totally wrong. So instead, we're going to have first index matchings return type be optional. It'll be an optional with the associated value being an int. And so it's either going to return set or not set. It's going to return set if it was able to find that first index and the associated value will be the index. Or it's going to return not set, the none case right there, if it couldn't find that, in that, that matching thing in there. Another good example just of a, of a normal variable would be if, let's say, in my matching game in the model, what if I had a variable which is like the index of the currently face-up card? Okay, well, when the game starts, there is no face-up card. So what would that index be? It's like it's not set. So we're going to use an optional to do to store that. That var is not going to be of type int for the index. It's going to be of type optional. Now, the associated value will be an int because, of course, if it is set. We want to know what that int is. There's a couple of good examples, which I'm going to show in the demo right after this. So this happens surprisingly often that you need some variable who sometimes is not set, it's unspecified. You want to return a value that says, I couldn't do this, that kind of stuff. So Swift introduces a lot of syntactic sugar, basically special syntax to be able to make it really easy to use optional, so much so that you're going to think that optionals are just some kind of magic type in Swift. But underlying it all, it's just this enum. It's really nothing more to it than that. So let's take a look at all this syntactic sugar. First one is, uh, how do we declare or to say that we want this type? So right here in yellow, you see that string question mark. That is declaring that hello, this bar hello, is of type optional, an optional whose associated value is a string. We would call this an optional string. When students are first exposed to this, they think that the type of hello is a string that somehow is modified to be optional. No, the type of hello here is an optional. Its associated value is a string, but it's an optional. So that's how we declare it. That's how, that is how we type the type, how we type in with our fingers, the type optional string. Now, how about setting the value? 
Well, remember, optional string, it's an optional. It only has two cases, none and some. So we set the none case by just saying equals nil. So the keyword nil in Swift means optional dot none. That means the not set case of an optional is nil. And similarly, we can say, uh, hello, this optional string equals the string hello. And Swift is smart enough to know that that means set this optional to the sum case and use hello as the associated value, right? So that string hello in this case is set and it's optional, uh, it's associated value is hello. Note that optionals always start with a kind of an implicit equals nil. This is nice because remember that in structs and classes, all vars have to have an initial value. We've jumped through a lot of hoops to try and get all of our vars to have initial values so far. Well, optional, no hoops to jump through because it gets an implicit equals nil or in the enum world, dot none for all vars. It makes sense, right? Because you've got an optional here, it's either set or not set. Well, it can start out not set. You could initialize it to equals hello if you wanted to but you can just leave it uninitialized, but it's not really uninitialized. It does get initialized to the none case. So how about accessing the value? So let's say I have a var like hello, and it's an optional, optional string, let's say, and I want the string. How do I get the string? How do I get that associated value? Am I gonna have to do, like you see down here in the right, switch on it and then do case this? Of course not. There's a simple way to do that switch on it. Two ways, actually. One is exclamation point. If you put an exclamation point after a var that is an optional, it will assume that it's in the sum case, the set case, and get you the associated value. But if you're not, it crashes your program. Exclamation point is truly what we call it force unwrapping because you're forcing that thing to be unwrapped and give me that string. But if that string's not there because the optional is in the not set case, then it crashes your program. And we're gonna see in the demo, this sounds like, oh, you know, I would never use this. I never want my program to crash, but it can actually be quite useful in cases where you know this is never supposed to be the case. You can easily find bugs and development and all that by making the thing crash and say, wow, that should never have crashed. But there is a safe way to do it, and that's by assigning it to another variable, a safe variable, and you do that with if let. So you see in the lower left corner here, the all the yellow is surrounding how you do the if let. You say if let some safe version equals the optional, hello is an optional, then that safe hello is going to be of type string. It's going to get the value if the optional is in the sum case. And then inside the curly braces after there, if let's say hello equals open curly brace, in that curly brace, safe hello will exist in there and it will be a string, not an optional, okay? It's, it's grabbed the associated value out of the optional safely and is executing. Now, if that hello were in the not set case, then it just wouldn't even execute that code that says print safe hello, wouldn't even be executed. It would do the do something else down there. That's like on the right there, the lower right, switching on hello, and in the case that it's in the not set case, you're gonna do that something else that's in the else. Otherwise, if it's in the sum case, then you're just going to get the string out of there and, and do the print safe hello in there. So that's how we get the value, the syntactic sugar for getting the value of an optional, either forcibly grabbing it out of there and crashing if we can't find it, or doing an if let to a safe variable, a safe landing spot for it. Another cool little syntactic sugar is the optional defaulting. So this allows you to really simply provide a default when you're accessing an optional, in case that optional is in the not set case and says it's equal to nil. Here I have a little constant called x, which is of type optional string, optional string. And I may have set it to something, maybe I set it to nil, maybe I set it to have something. But now I'm saying let y equal x, but if x is nil, use foo. That's what that question mark, question mark means right there. So y is always gonna be, in this case, of type string, because if x, which is an optional, is in the set case and it has an associated value, y is gonna get it. But if x is in the not set case, then this question mark, question mark is gonna make y get the value foo. All right, so I've shown on the right what it would look like in enum form there. All right, so optionals are best learned about in action. So we're going to do two major things
with optionals in this demo. One, we're going to fix that first index of matching, as I mentioned. And number two, we're going to make our game actually play the memorized game, start matching cards. And to do that, a central piece of that is to have a variable that keeps track of this card that's face up. Because when there's a card face up, I have to match it when someone picks another card. So let's dive right into that demo. All righty. Now that we know what optionals are, we can use it to fix this bogus thing that we had right here. What was bogus about this? Well, we have this function that found the first index matching some element in an array of identifiables, which it did. It went through and found the first one. But if it couldn't find it, it returned zero. And zero means the index of the first thing in the array, which is especially bogus if this array is empty, which it could be. So, so how are we going to fix this? We're going to fix it by having our return type. Instead of being an int, it's going to be an optional. Notice I said that this expression is an optional. It's an optional whose associated value is an int, but it's an optional. People sometimes get a little confused at the beginning thinking that this is somehow an int with some modifier on it. No, this is a different type from int. It's a type called optional. This optional int, we might call it, allows us to return nil right here, or not set value of the optional, when we couldn't find it. And it's really good at communicating to anyone who calls this, I couldn't find this. Our normal return is returning an int, and Swift is smart enough, of course, that if you have an optional int and you return an int, it will return the optional in the set state with the associated value being that int, exactly what you want. So this is it. Now, this is no longer in any way a bogus function, completely good function. And we can use it in the two places where we call this. Let's go over here to grid. Let's start with this one. So here is grid using first index. It's getting the index. This local variable right here, if we option click on it now, is now of type optional int. Well, that's going to be a problem down here. And we'll see an error appear here, which is value of optional type int must be unwrapped to a value of int. And indeed, layout's location of item at does not take an optional as its argument. It takes an int. Now, we could take this thing's advice and say, all right, let's unwrap it. This is how we unwrap an optional. This takes an optional that's in the set state and gets its associated value. However, when the optional is in the not set state, this crashes your program. Now, some of you might say, whoa, why are we ever going to use exclamation point? It's terrible. It crashes my program sometimes. Well, yes, but in this case, it might actually be good to leave this exclamation point in here because it should never be the case that we look up the first index of one of our items, which we only got by four reaching through our item array. This should never be nil. And if it ever were nil, something's going terribly wrong somewhere in my code, and I'd kind of like it to crash, so I'd find that problem. But maybe I'm really conservative, and when I ship my code to my customers, I really want to make sure no matter what, it doesn't crash with one of these exclamation points. So I could kind of protect my customers by protecting this code and say, if index does not equal nil, then do this. And that will protect this code so that it can't crash, right? Because if index is not nil, then unwrapping it right here is always going to work. But this doesn't build. And why does this code not build? It says here, missing return in a function expected to return some view. Indeed, this function is supposed to return some view. And it does return some view in the case that index is not nil. But if index is nil, currently it returns nothing. That's a problem. I'm not even sure what we would want to return in that case here. So we're going to have to take a little different strategy to return some view here that has a conditional. And we've seen it before. It's over here in our view. Z-Stack. Z-Stack had a conditional. If it was the card was face up, it did one thing. If it was face down, it did another thing. This function right here that Z-Stack takes, remember, is called the view builder. It's the same thing that our 
Geometry Reader takes, same thing for each takes, HDAC, they all take this thing, View Builder, which is a function, but it's a special kind of function where you can put these if thens in there and you can just list views and it turns that all into something that is some view, right? So the ZStack can have some view as its content. Well, we can do this same thing over here in our grid, but we don't need to do any layout. We're doing the layout with our frame and position. So we want something that takes a view builder that kind of does nothing. And there is such a thing, it's called group. So group is like a Z stack or any of these other things in that its function argument here is a view builder. However, it doesn't do anything to what's inside of here. It allows you to do the if and thens and all that, and you can still list the things, but it does not lay them out or try to position them in any way. And so our positioning will continue to work in here. So we turn this to a two line function instead of one liner. So we have to put return in here to, get, to make sure we're returning the group. But now we are returning group, which is some view. And group is just using this view builder stuff to go like this. Now you might ask, what does group do if index is nil? Well, it's going to return a group that has some sort of empty content, right? Its body is going to be an empty view. There's actually a view called empty view, probably returns that, but we really don't care. We're just using the view builder functionality here. We know we can do ifs. And we're going to find that group is useful in a lot of other situations as well. As its name implies, it's good for grouping things. That's because group, its view here is a view builder view. That's why we're able to do the if but it's also why we would be able to list some views and thus group them. So that's really probably the primary reason group exists. That's why it's called group. But to be honest, I really probably wouldn't have gone through all the trouble of doing this. I don't think there's really any reason to check if this index is nil. It should never be nil, as I mentioned before. So I likely would have just removed all this on back to where we were before and let this index force unwrap happen. And if it crashed my app, it crashed my app. It never should. And so I, I want to find it in development. And this code is it's a lot cleaner without all that view builder stuff in there as well. The other thing I might do is move this exclamation point from down here where I'm passing this bar to up here where I'm actually getting the value of this bar. So get that first index and immediately force unwrap it. That turns this index variable right here into an int and we can pass it directly. All right, so there's one other place where we used first index, that's in our model. So let's go over here and take a look at the damage we wrought by switching over to first index here. Here we're gonna use a little different strategy to get around the error that the optional must be unwrapped is I'm gonna use the if in front of my let, which is a really cool feature. Just put the if in front and then you put curly braces and do anything you want. And this anything you want will only actually happen if this thing returns non-nil. If it returns nil, this code just doesn't even get executed. In here, notice that this if let allowed us to keep colon int as the type of chosen index. We don't need that by the way because it's going to infer it but chosen index is in fact an int it's only going to actually exist if this first index returns to non-nil and that's the only time this code can be executed either but this does exactly what we want it protects us against chosen index it means choose does nothing if we can't find this card in our cards then this does nothing that's exactly what we want we want it to do nothing let's run to make sure this optional business didn't break anything here we go. Yep, we can still flip our cards over, face up, face down. But now it's time to try and play the game. We'll need optional for that as well. We're going to try and make it so that these cards will actually match and maybe match cards will disappear from the game. That would be cool too. So how do we do that? How are we going to play our game, make it play? Well, we need a little bit of design. We are software designers. We have to think conceptually, how are we gonna make this happen? So I'm gonna run through in my mind the scenarios. First, all my cards are face down and I click on a card and no matching happens then. The card just flips face up, which is what it's doing in our code right there. 
now. So, okay, that's fine. Second state is I got that one card up and I click on a second card. Well, that's when I really need to match. So if there's one card face up and there's a card clicked on, that's when I'm going to play my game. If there's two cards face up now and I press a third card, now I need to essentially turn those other two cards face down. Whether they're matched or not, they need to be turned face down. And the card I just touched on, that's going to be the one that's face up. In those three scenarios, that's all the scenarios there are. In those three scenarios, the only time I actually play the matching game is if there's one and only one card face up at the time I touch on a new card. So I need to detect that case when there's one and only one. So I'm going to have a var which keeps track of the index of the one and only face up card. And this is an index into my array, so it's coming in, but it might be the start of my game and there's no face up card, or maybe there's two face up cards. So this really needs to be an optional. Notice that I didn't get the error down here that I haven't initialized this. There's no errors, but I haven't initialized this yet. No errors. And that's because all optionals get initialized to nil automatically. So there's an equals nil. You could type it if you want, but if you don't put it in there, it's going to be there. And that makes sense, right? Optionals equals nil means it's not set. Total makes total sense that this bar starts, starts out the game not set. So let's keep going here. I got this cho chosen index, and I really only want to pay attention to cards that uh, are in obviously in my array, but also that are not already face up. If you're if a card is already face up and I tap on it, I'm just going to ignore it. Now you'd think this would work, right? Get the chosen index here and the chosen index did not face up, but it's complaining that chosen index is unresolved. So if you want to do an and like this, where you're saying if let of something, and then you want to do and on that something, instead of and here, you're going to use comma. So comma is like a sequential and, where it does this first, then that's done, it can do this, and shows an index is set. And you can even have more of these, like I might also want to ignore cars where the chosen index is not, not matched. So I'm only going to touch on cards that are face up and unmatched. Otherwise, I just ignore those cards. We use that comma notation quite a bit with these if lets. Inside here, I know that I've chosen a card that was face down and not yet matched. So I just want to see if there's one and only one face up card right now. So I'm going to say if I can let potential match index equal the index of the one and only face up card, now I might have a match because there's one and only one face up card. I just turned another card over. We need to try and match it. No problem if the cards of the chosen index, if it's contents, remember the content on the card right here, that's what's on the card, equals the cards at the potential match index content, then woohoo, got a match. Now this is making an error happen. Why is this making an error? It says binary operator equals equals cannot be applied to two card content operands. Hmm. Indeed, both of these things are type card content, right? That's our don't care down here. Why can't we do equals equals on card content? It's a string, right? Emoji string. Oh, wait a second. This is a generic memory game playing thing. It, these are not emoji in here. They're card content, which is a don't care for us. This could be anything, images, strings, ints, whatever. We're trying to say equals equals. If it's a string, okay, it works fine. What if it's an image? Can you say one image equals equals another? Uh, maybe not, I don't know. Equals equals is not something that just applies to everything. And in fact, how does equals equals work in Swift? Equals equals in Swift, believe it or not, is not built in to the language. It uses a feature in Swift called operators that lets you associate an operator like this with a function. And that's exactly what equal to equals does. It associates it with the type function equals equals. Now equals equals might seem like a funny name for a function in Swift, and it is kind of funny, but also remember that smiley face 
The emoji smiley face is a valid function name in Swift. Any Unicode character is pretty much is valid Swift. So equals equals is just as valid as smiley face. So this equal equals function is a type function and it just takes two arguments, which is the two things on either side of the equals and it returns a bool whether they're the same or not. That's it, it's exactly what you would expect. But not every type has this equals equals in it, only some types that can actually check for equality have that. But luckily that equals equals function is in a protocol called equatable. So we can use our constraints and gains here to say where our card content implements equatable. In other words, we are only going to work, our memory game only works when our card content can be equal to equal to be equatable. Let's go look at this protocol in the documentation. So I'm going to do option click. This is the kind of top level documentation about it, but let's go into the doc. Equal to equal is a very important protocol. You can see it's got a lot of explanation of what it means to say something is equal equal to something else, and transitive property, all this business. But when you get down to the list of functions about it, there's only one that is required. You see this required? That means it is part of the protocol and there's no default implementation by an extension anywhere. So you must implement this. And it's exactly what I said, a static, a type function that takes two of those things. Remember in the slides we had is greater than and had self. And so the argument is greater than with an int or it was a president, same thing here. If you have equals equals and it's let's say string, then self and self would be string and string. So it takes two strings, compares them. If it's int, it takes two ints, whatever. This is the only function you have to implement, really easy function, simple function to understand, although you have to read all this to make sure you really understand it. And the only one we have to implement in Equatable. All these other ones are not required because you get them for free by extension. Swift Foundation gives you these things for tuples and other things here automatically and does not equals. It gives you that one for free. It's all, they're all based on the equals equals here. This is a protocol, right? Protocol Equatable. So we are just forcing or constraining our card content, our don't care, to be equatable. We care a little bit, we care that it's equatable so we can compare it. All right, so if these two things match, then I'm just gonna say they're matched. Cards at the chosen index uh, is matched, equals true. And of course the cards at the potential match index, it did turn out to be a match, so it is matched, also equals true. So these cards are matched, that's awesome. Notice that no matter what, whether they match or not, there are two cards face up now. So the index of the one and only face up card is nil. It's not one and only one face up card, there are two. So that means this is nil. What about the else case here? So in this case, there is not one and only one face up card. So there's either zero or there's more than one. In this case, we wanna turn all the cards face down, except for the one we just chose, of course. So we're gonna do a little for loop index in our cards indices. And we're just gonna go for every single card is face up equals false. And then we'll make sure that we turn our card to true, turn it face up. Also notice in this case that the index of the one and only face up card is our chosen index. Because I just turned all of these face down and I'm gonna turn this one back up and so it's going to be the only face up card. So that's it. This is our logic. We don't need this card chosen in print anymore right there. And that's the entirety of making this work. So let's run, see if our game plays like we want. Well, this game turns out to be one of the easiest memory games out there because all the cards start face up. So that's no good. Let's go back to our model here and change it so that all the cards start face down. I think that's going to make for a much more challenging game. All right, let's try it. Ghost, yeah. Pumpkin, oh no, no match. Ghost, yeah. Spider, no, no match. Pumpkin, I think I know where the pumpkin is. It's right here. Yes. And then how about spider? Oh, now notice that it did turn my match cards face down. And if I try to touch on them, I'm currently clicking on these repeatedly they don't turn back up because they're already matched.
and we ignore cards that are already matched. But this is not very good UI to have these face down cards that you can't touch on, it does nothing. I'm really want to take these away. So if they're matched, I'm going to take them away. So let's go back to our UI and do that. Here's our card view. And here's where the cards are face up. No problem there. Here's where they're face down. I'm going to say, if the card is not match, then I'll draw it. But if it is match and it's face down, I'm going to draw nothing. Again, this is view builder. It's got these simple ifs. You can even nest these ifs inside the else's or inside the ifs of other ifs. Nested ifs are okay. And notice we don't even need an else here. View builder knows how to deal with the fact that the if didn't happen, and so nothing is going to be here. Essentially, there's an empty view. And in fact, in Swift UI, there is a view called empty view. And that's what this view builder is going to make for ZStack in the case the cards are face down. I think that fixes that. And we got pumpkin, spider, ghost. Oh, got a match. Ready? Woo! It took them away. Another match takes those away. Okay, this is excellent. Our game is basically functioning beautifully. There's one last thing I want to do, though, to my model. I'm a little concerned that I have this state, the index of the one and only face up card, that I'm having to keep in sync with my changes to the card. And this is kind of an error prone way to program when you have state in two places. The index of the one and only face up card is here. And it's also determinable from these cards. So let's use a computed bar here instead and get from the cards the index of the one and only face up card. And we're also going to do here a set so that if someone sets the index of the one and only face up card, we turn all the other cards face down. This is the first time you've seen a computer property that we can get the value of, but we can also set the value of. Let's do the set one first. It's kind of the simpler of the two. How are we going to react when someone sets the value of the index of one and only face up card? Well, in that case, we need to go through all of our cards. I'm just gonna go through our indices here and I'm gonna pretty much set all the cards to be face down, except I don't wanna do that if this is the one that you said was the index of the one and only face up card. Inside this set, there's a special variable called new value. So I can say if index equals new value, the value that the person said this was equal to, then it's face up. So new value is the special var only appears inside this set uh, for a computed property. And it's whatever the people set this to. Could be nil, by the way. This new value, it's an optional, so it could be nil. Index is an int. An int is never equal to an optional that's not set. So this equals would only be true if this is an optional that's set and its associated integer matches this integer. So that's it for set, pretty simple. What about getting? Well, to get it, I really need to look at all the cards and see which ones are face up and see if there's only one. So let's start by getting all the face up cards. So I'm going to say face up card indices. It's going to be an array of int. By the way, I'm going to use this syntax right here to mean array of int. This is exactly the same as array of int. I'm going to say that out in the real world, this is actually slightly preferred as the syntax. I'm not 100% sure of that, but it sure seems to me people prefer this over array of int. I like array of int. It's clear that that's a generic and the don't care is int and all that, but arrays are extremely common to use, so I can understand the shorthand there. So now, how am I going to get this face up card indices? It's starting empty right there, so I'm going to go for index in cards.indices, go through all my cards. If a card at a certain index is face up, then I'm going to put it in the face up card indices and that index. All right, now I have all the face up card indices. I'm going to say if the face up card indices dot count equals one, so one and only one card, then I'm going to return that face up card indices sub zero. By the way, there's another nice little var for that, which is dot 
first. And when we're typing first, notice that it's return type of this var, or the type of this var is int question mark, optional int. Why? Because the array might be empty. So if you say array.first and the array is empty, this will return nil. They're swift using optionals to communicate something. Otherwise, I'm going to return nil because if there's not exactly one card in the face up card list, then obviously the index of the one and only face up card is nil, not set. So now that this is calculated, I don't have to work so hard to make sure it's kept in sync. For example, in here, I don't even need to say that the index of the one and only face up card is nil. Just get rid of that code altogether because it's always going to know when there's two face up cards, it calculates it. And kind of similarly down here, because I set the one and only face up card to be this index, I don't need to set all the rest of them face down. That's going to be automatically done by the setter of this. And also this true of turning it face up, we only need to do in here because again, setting the index of the one and only face up card is going to make sure that this chosen index is face up. So that makes this code really pretty minimal to play an entire card matching game. Now that's at the expense of a lot of code up here. And we're gonna fix that in a second, but let's make sure that this has not broken anything. Here we go. Pumpkin, spider, 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 pumpkin, all right. Ghost, no, pumpkin, ghost, 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 pumpkin. So this is working. Beautiful looking code right here. Little bit more code here than we need. So how can we reduce this code a bit? Down here, I can only think of one thing to make this a little more efficient, which is that here I'm saying, if something is true, then set this to true, else set it to false. I could just take this and put it here. Then I don't need all the rest of this overhead of the syntax of all this if. So I'm just gonna set every card, I'm gonna set it to false unless the index is equal to what the person said this was equal to, like I'm doing right here. So that's nice, that, that's pretty minimal code. What about all this? Believe it or not, I'm gonna make it so this is one line of code. You know, we love one line of code in this class. Your first homework assignment proved that. So how am I going to make this one line of code? I'm gonna start by having all of this right here be one line. And I'm going to do that with a function in range called filter. So I'm going to take my cards indices, that's a range between zero, dot, dot, less than cards, dot count, and call this function filter. You see filter here in range, it returns an array of int. You see on the left here, array of int. And those ints are all the ints in this range where this function that takes an int and returns a bool returns true. So it looks like this, let's double click on this. Here it is. I can double click on this even, it fills it in for me. This is a function, an inlined function that takes an int and returns a bool. And we're supposed to return whether to include this int, which is one of the indices, in the resultant face up card indices. So we're making a new array by filtering out these other ones. So this is one of the indexes, so we'll call this index. And what do we want to do? We want to say return cards at that index dot is face up. So this is all we want to do. Of course, we like to make things less code in Swift, so we can take away this return. Maybe we'll put this up here, this. We can infer this return type, don't need that, don't need these parentheses in there. There's another thing I didn't show you last time that we can do to make these even smaller, which is that the arguments are specified here with index in. You can get rid of that and just use $0 and $1 and $2 for each of the arguments, $0 for the first argument, $1 for the second argument, etc. So we're almost there. This is all gone right here. And because we now just calculate this in one fell swoop, we're getting this warning here that this can now be a let, which it can. How about this? How do we get rid of this? What's going on here? Here we're actually just saying to the array of indices, if there's only one of you, give it to me, otherwise give me nil. 
Well, why don't we extend array, use an extension to array to have a var that does this? Because that seems like a reasonable array thing. Hey, Mr. Array, give me the only thing in yourself. Otherwise, give me nil. So let's create another little extension for array here. Little Swift file. We'll call this one array plus only, since it returns the only thing in an array. And this extension to array is going to extend all arrays. This extension to array is not like this one where it's where elements identifiable. This one extends all arrays. And it's going to add this var I'm going to call only. It's of type element question mark, optional element. And it's computed and it just returns the arrays count equals one first colon nil. So this is in array. So count is the count of the array. And if that equals one, we're using this ternary operator here to return the first item in the array, otherwise nil. Super simple. And that super simple code makes this all go away right here. We don't need any of this. Instead, we can just say dot only over here, and get rid of all of this, just return this. But since this is now a one liner, we don't need return. And we can even make it all be one line here like this as well. And this code has all of a sudden gotten a lot more compact. So let's make sure we didn't break anything there. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Yay, it works. Now this has set up this beautifully for your homework. You're going to now take this working game and do some enhancements to it. So check out the writer for that, and we'll see you next lecture. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.